Next, we're going to discuss uh, geometrical optics, that method of calculating the radar cross-section. And the current contribution is assumed to vanish except at isolated specular points. That's the basis of this method. Now, with geometrical optics, it's again an approximate method valid in the optical region where the size of the target is greater than uh, lambda. And it's based on ray tracing from the radar to the specular points on the surface of the star of the target. And specular points are those points whose normal vector points back to the radar. And it and they, those points will have a curvature in most cases. And the amount of reflected energy that comes back to the radar depends on the principal radii of curvature of the surface of reflection of that point. And we'll go into it later, but when uh, there isn't a curvature to that point, it's planar, and this method breaks down, but we'll get to that later. Geometrical optics calculations are pretty reasonably accurate to 10 or 15% for radii of curvature of 2 lambda to 3 lambda. And it, it breaks down with flat plates, as I said, with cylinders, which would have one dimension, where we would have an infinite radius of curvature, and other objects similar, and also at the edges of targets like flat plates. Now, here's in a view graph that will show you uh, how with the, we get to the, ra the radar cross-section of a sphere. The power density ratio, uh, if we have incident rays and they come back, is the ratio of the, of the power density of the scattered rays to the power density of the incident rays. And they are proportional to 1 over the surface, 1 over the area. And, and, and that's this ratio. And that goes to the area that's incident and the area that's scattered. Now, the area that's scattered is r squared uh, times the, the solid angle with this specular point and 4 pi um, where a squared divided by 4 times d omega is the area incident area and the radar cross section is just 4 pi times uh, r the distance to the radar divided by those quantities and that comes out to pi a squared so for the cross-section of a sphere, we get just the, the area that's the area subtended by the sphere, pi a squared. And in general, for an arbitrary specular point, the cross-section is pi times the, the radius of curvature in one dimension times the radius of curvature in the perpendicular dimension uh, the, at the specular point. Now, geometrical optics can take it as a method because it's looking at the, these curvatures. You can have single reflections, but it also takes into account double reflections. Here we have an example of a single reflection off of one sphere, and the incident energy comes in and, and reflects off of this sphere. And then we have energy coming in off of this from the radar, it hits this lower sphere, bounces up to the other sphere, and comes back. So you can have both sing single reflection or double reflection, and this method will take that into account. So that what you do is you'd first identify all specular points and add their contributions. Phase is calculated from the distance to and from the specular points. And the local radius of radii of curvature are used to determine the amplitude of the backscatter. For double or even triple reflections, identify all pairs of speculars, calculate each amplitude using single reflection method to calculate the amplitude and phase. And add them all up. Now on the physical optics. Here the, what we use is a tangent plane approximation to measure the currents. 
In physical optics, again, it's an approximate method for calculating. And here, the target size, again, has to be much greater than the wavelength. The method used is we take the stratton chu integral equation form of Maxwell equations. You remember that from the method of moments. Assume that the target is in the far field. And assume that the total fields at any point on the surface of the target are those that would be there if the target were flat. And it's called the tangent plane approximation. We assume a perfectly conducting target, and then the resulting equation for the scattered electric field can be readily calculated because we're going to be able to get with this tangent of plane approximation the currents quite readily. And the RCS is easily calculated from the scattered field. Uh, the uh, physical optics gives great great results um, if you're at normal or near normal incidence, let's say less than 30 degrees, and gives poor results at gra grazing angles or near the edges. That's where diffraction comes into play, and also the leading and trailing edges of wings or edges of flat plates. Now here is a view graph which shows you what's going on here. Uh, the perfect here is an infinite perfectly conducting plane and for that case and, and in this case the electric field is out and here we have down the uh, magnetic field it comes in and current is induced on this uh, plane and then out comes the scattered energy now the uh, what we assume is for an arbitrary conducting surface that for that small area where the ray comes in, that it's perfectly tangent. And the, uh, the, the perpendicular component, the normal component of the magnetic field, um, of, the, of, the, of the difference of the magnetic field is zero, but the uh, Maxwell's equation boundary conditions leave, leave us with that the uh, current will be twice the, the normal vector times across, excuse me, the magnetic field with this factor for the because it's we've got an expanding incident plane wave. And, uh, and that's the current for an incident plane wave. That's the scattered current, excuse me, from an incident plane wave. And so we can quite readily substitute this uh, scattered current into this case, where we get the scattered electric field. Now, what happens when the, what's the difference between normal and oblique incidence? In physical optics, the contributions add constructively in phase that come in. And for large plates, the edge contributions are very small. Uh, and so we get very good results where physical optics will be valid, except near the edges. And uh, near the edges, uh, what we have is oblique. We have a, a, oblique waves come in. And what happens is that we have Fresnel zones where the phases alternate. And in the um, oblique spec, in the scattering, these will all cancel. And what we'll have is because uh, of the different phases and, the, and the, the edge currents will predominate. And that's just set over here. And uh, the backscatter direction, the physical optics contribution is predominantly canceled. And we end up with the Fresnel zones at the edges causing most of the, of the uh, effect. And we see that over here with this measurement, uh, first in uh, this uh, bl bluish color. And then the red down here, we have the physical optics. Uh, approximation calculation, we see that we get very good agreement pretty much out to 30 degrees between measurement and the physical optics approximation where we're measuring uh, the 
cross-section between 0 and plus or minus 90 degrees from the normal, where we come in with an incident wave and go out theta. That's the, the aspect angle. But over here, but, but the physical optics doesn't give us the edge effects and that uh, the, the edge currents uh, the, that I talked about earlier uh, on this view graph are what give us those edge currents correctly. The, the physical give us the scattered electric field because the main contribution is the edge currents. Granted, they are down uh, almost 20, you know, 10, 20, almost 30 dB from the peak of the, the specular. Uh, but they they are a contribution that is is just not there with the physical optics approximation, and qu what we see also that both theories predict that the maximum cross section at broadside is four pi times the area squared divided by lambda, and this is a fifteen by fifteen centimeter plate at ten gigahertz with horizontal polarization on transmit and receive. And now let's move on to geometrical theory of diffraction. We've seen that both the geometrical theory of optics and the physical, opt physical optics um, have problems at the edges. So what we want to do is to add edge contributions. And uh, it, with the geometrical theory of diffraction, uh, in 1957, Keller, in a very classic and interesting paper, uh, broke great ground in making that calculation. And he used a ray tracing method to calculate the diffracted fields at the edges. So that if we have an incident electric field, um, he, he postulated and showed that a diff an edge diffracted field on a cone, excuse me, would, would would the uh, energy would come off at the at the conducting wedge the half angle of the cone would be beta it's equal to beta but the angle between the edge and the incident ray so that's the edge and the incident ray and that's beta and the diffractive field is proportional to a number of coefficients x and y which are the diffraction coefficients and also a divergence factor uh, gamma and so the electric field, the diffractive electric field, is given by this quantity. And the coefficients have either a minus or a plus, depending on whether the E field, the incident E field, is parallel to the edge or the H field is parallel to the edge. And the divergence factor uh, reduces the amplitude as the rays diverge from the scattering point. And that and, and, and that accounts for curved edges. Now the whole question is, is what is X and what is Y? Okay, uh, I'm just not going to go into the details of it. You can look in uh, Knott's book, Eugene Knott's textbook, and uh, see what those numbers are in their relatively complicated functions of the different geometries and angles. But here, the Keller cone well, it was a great breakthrough in calculating edge diffraction with the geometrical theory of optics. But if we look at the geometrical theory of optics, we have an awful lot of different kinds of scattering. And uh, first thing I'd, I'd like to know going back is if you're using the geometrical theory of optics, you wanted to add in the Kellogg uh, uh, diffraction off of an edge, since the electric fields are all vectors, you could take the electric field that's due from the end cap reflection that's scattered back at an angle, and then the diffraction, add those scattered electric fields, take the magnitude, and you, you know, and put that over the, the, the square of the magnitude of the incident field, and multiply it by the 4 pi r squared, and that we in the in the limit of long distances between the target and the uh, radar, that would be your radar cross section. Now, ray tracing also has an awful lot of other different kinds of physical phenomena that you can deal with. 
we've got I've gone over edge dif diffraction from a wedge. You can also have it from a plate. You can have corner diffraction and of course reflection and this for a plate. For a cylinder we can have a creeping wave around it or a sphere. We're not going into the physics a little later. We'll touch on that. Show you an example. We can have side reflection and I've talked about a specular which you could have off an end cap. And there again you just add up the a total electric field from each component. It's easy to understand with multiple interactions. The disadvantage is implement, it's difficult to implement for complex targets like uh, an F-16 with bombs and fuel tanks on the wings and jet engine inlets and it requires a more accurate description than the physical theory of diffraction. Now let's move on to the physical theory of diffraction and here what we're going to do is we're going to take the physical optics and we're going to add edge current contributions to that. We see that on this model of the cruise missile uh, what we do is we integrate the surface currents from, from the local tangent plane approximation. Say, say we look at the incident ray comes in, the electric field comes in at this angle and we're going to have a current in, right in that point from the physical optics and from that physical optics current. Uh, we'll also have uh, edge currents from wings and edge currents from diffraction here. And so what we're going to do is integrate the surface current obtained from the local tangent approximation. We add in any edge currents to the object. And the advantages are there's reduced computational requirements and it's applicable to an arbitrary complex geometries. The disadvantage is it neglects mutual interactions or shadows. The, the, the back part of this wing might be in a shadow and if you're calculating the cross section as a function of an angle, it'll, it won't take into account those shadows. Now physical, uh, the physical theory of diffraction. Um, notice all these, I want to say first a moment, a word or two about these edge effects and um, and edge currents and wedge, you know, the, the, these lower level um, additions to the speculars, which are the main cross section. Uh, if one is looking to make a, a vehicle or an object that's very, very, very low cross section, you've seen from what I've talked about before that it's a very straightforward thing to calculate the big main contributor. But to know the, the, the contributions of effects that are 40 or 50 dB down from the main contribution are quite difficult mathematically. And that's why these theories of diffraction have been added. And going back to 1896, uh, Summerfield, the, the mathematician, developed a method for finding the total scattered field from an infinite perfectly conducting wedge. When I say mathematician, uh, computational electromagnetics professionals are experts at applied math and they're also experts at, at Maxwell's equations, electromagnetism. The two go hand in hand. And uh, anyway, he, can, he calculated the, 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 that perfect, that field the scattered field from an infinite perfectly conducting wedge. But we know no air breathing vehicle at all has a perfectly, an infinite perfectly conducting wedge. And it was a real complexity. People didn't know how to calculate it for a finite. Um, a Russian, um, a brilliant guy, uh, Ufimstev, in 1957, published in the open literature, a very famous article, if you're into this business, uh, to obtain the edge current contributions by subtracting the physical optics contribution from the total scattered field. And that allowed 
uh, that paper was written in Russian in about 57. It was translated into English, I think, in the early to mid-60s. And um, it's been written up in uh, Knott's book that that was a, just a, a seminal paper to understanding um, accurately from a paper a conceptualization of an air, you know, an airframe, what its cross section would be, which you have to do before you build the plane. You know, you don't, you want to make sure you really understand what its cross section is going to be, down to the gnat's eye. And uh, and later, people have been continuing and continuing to perfect that work. And there's some very interesting papers. They're all referenced in. Uh, there's a uh, an English trans uh, translation of this uh, referenced in uh, in Knott's book, and also a number of other significant papers. Also Keller's paper in in 1957. So those two guys did their work, and Euphemstev's uh, uh, work, although done at the same time, didn't get out in the open. Not that it wasn't in the open literature, but it wasn't translated and understood by the community, world community, that incredible compu uh, computational physics um, contribution. And later, uh, the current from a, a finite length structures, oh, excuse me, not later, but now, the current from the finite length structures can be obtained by truncating the edge current from the infinite structure. So there's a method for calculating uh, the non-uniform edge current, which has been uh, extremely an important part of computational electromagnetics. And there's a number of other very, very bright people. Um, if you're interested in, I forget when it was, but it, uh, you'll, you'll see when you look at um, the, the chapter in Knott's book, if you look at the references, there are a number of papers that are all in the same volume, uh, maybe 10 years ago, of the proceedings of VIEEE, which at that time stated all the different um, main ideas in uh, radar calc. It was a whole special issue on radar uh, cross sections. And it's a, it's a, I keep it on my bookshelf. It's a great volume I always go back to instead of looking up in uh, the IEEE's